Number 144, Mshabeni Olidundu. Yeah. 144, sure. Two. Kwela One 
I know the song, but it's very difficult in Zulu. Okay, let's do English. Let's go. <laughs> let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Mm. Mm. Do it in English. Is my saxophone on? It's 197. Yeah. There'll be no dark valley when Jesus comes. Two. There'll be no dark valley when Jesus comes. There'll be no dark valley when Jesus comes. There'll be no dark valley when Jesus comes to gather his loved ones home. To gather his loved ones home. To gather his loved ones home. There'll be no dark valley when Jesus Jesus comes to gather his loved ones home. I think it's a little bit. It's fine, maybe. Okay, are you fine? Can you just sing it to me? Come on. <laughs> okay, let's place this. There'll be no more sorrow when Jesus comes. There'll be no more sorrow when Jesus comes. There'll be no more sorrow when Jesus comes to gather his loved ones home. To gather his loved ones home to gather his loved ones home there'll be no dark valley when jesus comes to gather his loved ones home there'll be no more weeping when Jesus comes, there'll be no more weeping. When Jesus comes, there'll be no more weeping. When Jesus comes to gather his loved ones home, to gather his loved ones home, to home. There'll be songs of greeting when Jesus comes. There'll be songs of greeting when Jesus comes. There'll be songs of greeting when Jesus comes to gather his loved ones home. To Um, yeah, 201. Today, there's nothing backing us, so the voices must, must come through. Let's go. Okay, two. 
Inyanga enkur.
Um, good evening and happy Sabbath, everybody. Welcome to day three of our, well, last prayer session that we're going to have um, in the evening. No, tomorrow we're going to meet up, but it won't be a prayer session per se. Um, may I ask that we, well, I suppose Mufundis is up here. He's going to pray. So I will then just tell you that he's about to come up and start the prayer garden, and I'm going to walk off. Great the church in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And mine is to pray for you. And um, God has given me a burden. And the burden that he gave me is to help people who are saved but are not free to release the burdens that they carry. When you read um, Luke chapter 4, verses 18, the Bible says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's an, he has anointed me, the anointed one, the Messiah, to preach the good news, the gospel, to the poor. He has sent me to announce release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, send to send forth as delivered those who are oppressed, who are downtrodden, who are bruised, who are crushed, who are broken down by calamity. The biggest problem we have as Christians, or maybe let me start by saying, um, I'm doing a course um, post-grad, it's Christian counseling. In the first module, the first thing they say is that Christians don't believe in counseling. Christians don't believe in counseling because they think that when Jesus Christ, when they accept Jesus Christ as their personal savior, all their problems are taken away. Except that as they live their lives as Christians, they realize very soon that they are saved, but not free. And I'm here as a pastor who spends a Monday to Friday here at Calvin, dealing with problems that you have as a church. And I'm talking, as I'm talking here, I'm looking at some people that I've met here at church. I know that you are saved. And there's no problem about your salvation. The problem is that you are saved, but you still carry rejection. You still feel that your mom or your dad rejected you. You don't know what to deal, what to do with that. You, you are saved, but you are very bitter. Bitter at your ex-husband, bitter at your ex-wife. You bitter at your friends. You bitter at your mother. Bitter at your father. You are saved. It doesn't change the fact that you are saved. You still remain saved. But the reality is you still carry a lot of resentment. A lot of unforgiveness. We are saved. That doesn't change. And I want to say to you, today give those burdens to Jesus Christ. And it does not start by prayer. It ends by prayer. But first, find a counselor. Find Pastor Ketelo. Find Pastor Veli. Find any other person, a counselor, a psychologist, people that can help you offload the burden you carry. So when you read this passage in Luke chapter eight, uh, 4, verses 18, there are three things that are very key there. One, Jesus Christ came to preach the good news, but that's not the only thing he came to do. The second thing he came to do is to bring recovery to the sight, to recovery of sight to those. In other words, he came to meet the spiritual thinking needs and the physical and the emotional. And I'm here to ask you, 
How long will you carry whatever it is that you carry with you today? So if you are here today and you carry some of the things that I mentioned, some of them are so deep that they go back to your father, your mother. Maybe let me say this. A lot of us here today, we're struggling in our marriages. We think that the problem is the husband and the wife, when in actual fact, the problem is just simply that you've not dealt with the trauma, the childhood trauma that you carry. And I'm here to make a challenge to each and every one of us that are here. And it, also those who are online, if you know that also you're carrying some stuff, you don't know what to do with it. Today I was at uh, Sun, I was at Four Ways, came to a family that's doing so well, but so broken. So much money, but so broken. And I'm here and I believe that I'm talking to people like that today. And if you know that you are here and you are facing some of those challenges, I want to invite you to stand. Please note, I'm not praying for money. I'm not praying for money. I'm not praying for a job. But I'm praying for rejection that you carry inside of you. The anger that you carry. And today you want to release it. Before the pastor preaches, you just want to let go of it. You just want to let go of that unforgiveness. You want to release yourself. If you're here today and you carry that childhood trauma and you just want to let go of that thing here today, I want to challenge you to stand. By the way, you don't need the person that hurt you here now. You just need to let go so that you can be free. If you are here, stand with me. I want to pray with you. Pray with you. We want to ask God to pick up the broken pieces of our emotions, broken pieces of our hearts, and put it back together. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus Christ. We don't know what we would do without you. Lord Jesus Christ, I now want to go back to the womb. Because some of us, our brokenness did not begin when we were five. Some of our brokenness began when we were conceived in a family that was broken. Some of us, Lord Jesus Christ, the brokenness is right there in the womb. When my mom carried me and she was full of anxiety because this man was about to leave her. Full of anxiety. And I'm living today, I carry anxiety and I don't even know why and where I got anxiety. But I inherited anxiety from my mother. Chito Lung Leo, there are people here who are hurt who are painful, who are, who, are, who are hurting and are in pain. Some of us are carrying the pain from childhood. We have reactions we don't know what to do with. We can't keep relationships. They get broken and we keep on blaming other people when we know deep down we have issues and we don't know what to do with them. We've gone for counseling to psychologists. They've made sense but we still can't get ourselves to a place where we can release everything and leave it at the foot of Jesus Christ. We want to claim our freedom. There's no doubt in our minds, in our hearts, and in our never system that we are saved, we are saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. There's no doubt that Jesus loves us. There's no doubt that we are going to heaven, but we are not free, and we want to be free. Lord Jesus Christ, I pray for some here. They've been trying to get married, and they've given up. 
They don't know what's wrong with them. But every time they are right at the point of getting married, it just gets aborted. And others, Gulungulu, they have given up on the hope of getting married at all. In the name of Jesus Christ, I revive, resuscitate that hope. Abangeke basho nebe single, benga nabantuan. In the name of Jesus Christ, Father, I pray. As we release the trauma, Father, I pray for healing in the name of Jesus Christ. As your children are releasing the unforgiveness that they carried for many years, could not get themselves to forgive their father, could not get themselves to forgive their mother, their father for abandonment. Their mother for a verbal abuse. Punishing them for what their father did. Lord Jesus Christ, we are here today. We stand. We want to release. And we want to release that unforgiveness. We want to release the bitterness. We want to, we want to release the resentment. The shame. The guilt. We want to release it. And some father are at home now. They are crying because of this prayer. And as they stand and they pray to release father, I pray. Heal your children. Heal your children. Give freedom to your children in the name of Jesus Christ. Help them carry. Thank you, Jesus. Lord Jesus Christ, for those who are struggling, I could come seven. They've been looking, searching. They have the qualifications. But every time they go for interviews, they are always overlooked, even when they were best candidates for the job. Father, it ends here and it ends now. In the name of Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you that everyone who came here carrying a burden, everyone that we've prayed for, that the pastor has preached to and prayed for, in the name of Jesus Christ, Father, I pray. I take authority. And in the name of Jesus Christ, Nditikuwe, Yosukana, Nengkululeko ya aboge kamalka Yesu Christu. Yosukana, Nemichato ya aboge kamalka Yesu Christu. Yosukana, Nemisebenz ya aboge kamalka Yesu Christu. Thank you, Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you and we claim and we receive. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. I greet the church in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We want to thank God once again for the gift of life and the opportunity for us to be together this evening. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Okay. So when we started, we looked at these five single sisters who acted as a unit because they needed to establish a new narrative for women, and they did it. And then yesterday, I apologize, I was told I should have warned you to bring tissue. 
about yesterday. But yesterday we were looking at this phenomenal mother, Bathsheba, a representative of many women in our lives who just made things happen for her son. And that's what we were celebrating. So today we're going to celebrate another woman. Um, but let me warn you that today's woman is not what you expect to be celebrated. Um, but also, I have been very conscious of trying to, uh, through the help of the Holy Spirit, go across the board. I started with five single girls. I moved to a mother. Are we still together? Because I'm trying to make sure that you understand that within the word of God, we can celebrate all categories of life. You know, um, It's like when I get called for a week of prayer for family life. And then they tell me to talk about marriage. And I say, then that's not family life. You know, say you are calling me for a marriage enrichment seminar. Then I'll talk about marriages. But family life, I have to talk about kids. I have to talk about finances. I have to talk about communication. I have to talk about being single. I have to talk about siblings and their problems. No, that's family life. So even here, we, I, 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 with the help of the Holy Spirit, the intention was to make sure that we don't isolate any category of women. In the celebration, are we still together? Yes. Um, and, and, and today we're going to celebrate wives. Okay? Um, so I've been with the single ladies and we, we've been to the mothers. Now we're going to talk about the wives. But I do want to say in advance again, I'm not going to borrow from where you think. Um, let's go to First Kings chapter 21. First Kings chapter 21. Thank you. Uh, Pastor Veli for that uh, prayer. Thank you so much. First Kings um, chapter 21. We're going to read from verse 1 to verse 16. Here we go. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard which was in Jezreel next to the palace of Ahab king of Samaria. So Ahab spoke to Naboth saying, give me your vineyard that I may give it, uh, that I may have it for a garden of vegetables because it is near next to my palace and it will give and i will give you a vineyard which is better than it or if you should so choose i will pay you its money's worth but Naboth said to Ahab may the lord for forbid that i would give the inheritance of my forefathers to you so Ahab went into his house sullen and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him when he had said to him, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And so the king Ahab laid in his bed, turning away, refusing to entertain anyone, neither to eat. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said to him, Why are you so suddenly down? Why is your spirit not good? You have neither eaten nor entertained anyone. He then replied to her saying, It is because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite and I asked him to give me his vineyard for the money that it is worth or perhaps if it may please him, I would give him another vineyard which will also be pleasing to him. And he has said to me, I will not give you my vineyard. Then Jezebel his wife said to him, now you exercise authority over all Israel. Get up, eat your food, and let your heart be full of joy. I, on the other hand, will give you the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. And she wrote some letters to the leaders and to the honorables and the elders and nobles of Israel dwelling in the city together with Naboth. And this was the letter she wrote. Let it be known that there will be a fast and sit Naboth in a high place among the people and see to it that two men are also on either side of him. Then you ought to accuse him that he has blasphemed against the Lord and the king. Then bring him out and stone him that he may die. So indeed, the nobles and the elders of the city and the inhabitants did as Jezebel had said in the letters. And so it was that when the letters were written, the proclamation was made. 
a fast came, and Naboth was seated as a guest of honor among the people. And then two of the men, very untrustworthy fellows, came in and sat before him. And they indeed testified and witnessed against him, saying, Naboth has blasphemed the name of the Lord and the king, and they have witnessed it. And so Naboth was led out of the city where he was stoned to death. Then the message was sent to the queen Jezebel that Naboth had been stoned. And so it came to be that when Jezebel heard the news that Naboth had been stoned and was dead, that Jezebel came to King Ahab and said, Get up, now take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, because he refused to give it to you for money or for another. But now Naboth is dead. He is no longer alive. So it was when Ahab heard that Naboth is dead, that he got up and went down to take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. I'm told we have load shedding at eight, so I need to um, rush very quickly. By far, my most favorite female in the Bible is Jezebel. I love her. She is somebody that I have spent quite a lot of time um, looking into and reading articles that have been written about her. And perhaps the first thing I'd want to challenge us to understand when reading the Bible is always to remember that the people we are reading about are not different to us. It is very easy to want to make conclusions about Jezebel as if one is not a Jezebel themselves in their own lives in different categories. So when we read the stories in the Bible, we have not been authorized to read with a superiority mentality. We are simply learning reading to grow. We are not reading to establish how better we are than them. So we don't read to validate ourselves. We read to find the grace of God among people who are sinners like us. Okay? Now, Jezebel came to Israel to marry King Ahab. She was a princess at home. Her father was the king of Sidon. But you see, the relationship between the Israelites and the Sidonians was complicated in that sense. A few hundred years before Ahab, the first Israelite king to marry a Sidonian was King Solomon. And the princess he married led him to idolatry. The Bible says it, that because of his Sidonian wife, he began to worship idols. So it's not a new thing. For some reason, the kings of Israel like marrying Sidonian princesses. And as soon as these princesses arrive, they introduce them to idolatry. That was their relationship with them. So Solomon started and then followed um, King Ahab. He married the princess Jezebel, who then came to Israel and became Queen Jezebel. I have a lot to say about her and her, her frame of mind, and I'll touch some of those things uh, 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 where, where possible. But I want us to read about Jezebel and be human and not be gods to her, but be human. Because there's a context about Jezebel that we have missed in our reading of her. And I'm not saying she's excused for the things she did. But I am saying while she must take responsibility for her sins, she also has a context. Are we together? For example, what many of you have never read about Jezebel happened in 1 Kings chapter 20. Where the king of the Arameans, Ben-Hadad wanted to attack Israel and wrote a letter to King Ahab and said to him, give me everything that you have or I will come and attack you. And he complied. This is what Ahab said to Ben-Hadad. Everything in my house is yours. Including my wives and children. 
Now, long story short, God rescued Israel before Ben-Hadad could attack, could destroy them. That's where the song, the God of the Mountains is still God in the Valleys, comes from, from that story. Because they fought the Arameans twice. First, they fought them at the mountaintops because Israel is full of mountains. They won. Then the Arameans said, look, our gods are the gods of the valleys, which is why we have chariots. If this battle was fought on the valley, our gods would have an advantage. Then God says to Ahab, go and fight them in the valley because they think the Lord is superior in the mountains. They fought there as well and they won. But what many of us have missed is think about this very carefully. Thieves break into your house. Your husband negotiates with the thieves and says, take everything, my wife and children included. Now, tell me which woman the following day would be okay. You see, there's a context we miss about Jezebel. The woman we see has just been through a trauma where her husband traded her life and the life of their children so that he may survive. Think about that for a moment before you judge these characters. Some of you judge the wife of Job as a disbeliever. Have you ever lost 10 children in one day? Have you ever received a letter telling you that all your children dropped and died that very day? That is why while we judge Mrs. Job, guess what? At the end of the story, Mrs. Job is the same woman God used to give more children because God understood her pain when she was saying, curse God and die. Don't read with superiority. Read with understanding that these are humans like you. What would you have done in the same situation? Are we still together? So, <coughs> excuse me. Jezebel, one day, the story says, and I explained a bit about the geography things around the palace yesterday. So, Naboth is a very big man. We know this because he has a farm next to the palace. He's no ordinary fellow. He's big. He's a noble. He's a very high-ranking somebody. You, you don't get to share property around the king's property, and you are a nobody. So Naboth is a big guy, comes from a probably influential family. And, 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 and Ab says to him, look, your vineyard is right next to my palace. I think your vineyard would be perfect for, for the king's farm so that my food is planted there, my animals and whatever. Give it to me. I'll give you something better. And of course, then Naboth says, and, and I remember I explained this when I was dealing with the five girls, that inheritance cannot go between tribes. You remember? So Naboth says, I can't give it to you. You and I are not of the same tribe. And God had made it clear that the land inheritance must stay within a particular tribe. Are we still together? By the way, this is the fundamental biblical mistake that the African National Congress still makes today. It is unbiblical for a foreigner to own land in your homeland. It's unbiblical. They can lease it. They can use it, but they cannot own it. And for some reason, we all want to be apologetic about it. You shouldn't be. It's our land. We are not saying whites and others cannot come and do business or lease it. But ownership, biblically, can never be transferred for land. Can never be. And for me, I stand my biblical ground on that one. Let them come. Let them rent farms, but the ownership. God says, even go read Leviticus. God says we are free to lease land to anyone, local or foreigner, but you shall never give them a title deed. It is not, it is my gift to your forefathers. He gave them Europe, he gave others Asia. He gave us Africa. It's our inheritance. They want to own land, Europe. You want to use land in Africa, you get a lease, but you don't own it. I want to use land in Europe, I get a lease, 
I want to own land, Africa. You can go cry about it afterwards. <laughs> but, so, so, Nabot is clear, I can't give you the land. There are rules, biblical rules about what we must do. Ahab goes home. He is stressed. He doesn't eat. He doesn't see anyone. Now, fairly, these are polygamous kings. But as you saw yesterday, there's always that one wife. That's the real queen. Everyone is just accompanying her. But really, you know, there's no such a thing in polygamy like he loves all of us equally. You're lying. There's one he loves. And then all of you are the assistants to this one. Jezebel runs this house. There are many other queens, but Jezebel is the queen. So Jezebel comes to the chamber and finds him there and she says, Husband, what is going on? Why are you lying here? And, and he explains. He says, oh, as we know, I, I, I tried to get Naboth to sell me land or to at least exchange with another vineyard. And this is what he said. Okay? And here begins, for me, a celebration of Jezebel as a wife. I want to show you a phenomenal woman. A wife of highest degree. Queen Jezebel. Listen to this lady. She says, why are you distraught? What's wrong? And he explains. <laughs> Jezebel then says to him, right, number one, verse seven, you are now king in Israel. You exercise authority over a nation. Number one duty of a wife, make sure your husband doesn't miss the big picture. Make sure your husband doesn't trip over little issues and ends up losing big things. Listen, he is depressed about a small farm. She says, you have authority over Israel. Ulele, who depressed why he farm. You have authority over Israel. You are sleeping here because there's a farm. Jezebel immediately sets priorities straight. She says, my duty is to remind you what's big and what's small. My duty is to make sure you don't lose sight of the vision. She says, you have authority over Israel. <laughs> Jezebel was born pagan. I use that in inverted commas. But she seems to understand Genesis better when the Lord says, I shall create a helper for him. She rises to the occasion. She says, hey, hey, babes, look at me. Look at me. We are running a kingdom. Yes. Say it after me. Ahab is king. Ahab is king. Say it. Believe it. Ahab is king. Look at me. Ahab is king. What does Ahab do? He rules Israel. Man, I can picture this woman holding his cheeks saying, focus, focus. Ahab rules Israel. Say it. And I can picture this man saying, Ahab rules. No, 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 no. Believe it. Own it. Command it. Project it. Ahab rules Israel. Let me tell you. Queen Jezebel says lesson number one. If your husband is fumbling, set him straight. Get your husband to focus on what needs to be focused on. 
Ibamba ngenchebe into yakho. You see, the problem is some of you don't even know what to do. Oh, Jezebel says, know what to scratch. Know what to touch. And command attention and say, look at me. Look at me. We run Israel. What do we do? We run Israel. In other words, don't lose focus. Be very clear on what we do in this house. In the house of Ahab, we are ruling a country. Are you with me? Now, second thing. Let's go with Jezebel here. And she says to him, So arise, eat your food, and let your heart, heart be cheerful. In other words... Stop allowing your emotions to be commanded by a pond when you own an ocean. You are clearly drawing your emotional reactions from the wrong source, Ahab. You can't be owning, running Israel, but your moods are dictated to by a small farm. She said, my husband, clearly your emotions is like a tree. She is saying, your roots are drinking from a pond when there's a lake next to you. Connect your roots to the right source of vision. You, my husband, your emotions are moved by a farm you can't control, yet you have authority to control a country. Because you know what, what Jezebel is saying? Jezebel is saying, and then in the process, in the process, what has happened? You are now sleeping in the bedroom over a farm. But guess what? You are now not only upset about a farm, but you are also now upset in the throne that runs Israel. So because of a farm, you are also losing the nation. Because while you are sleeping here, the throne has no one seated on it. So tonight, we are losing a kingdom and a farm. So decide, my husband, are we running a country or are we losing it over a farm? Love this lady. She says, let's be clear on what we have. Vision. Intention. Two, let's draw from the right source for what controls our emotions. Okay? Let, let, let's try and draw from the right source. Unfortunately, unfortunately, Jezebel is necessary because us men, we are foolish like that. Okay? We're foolish like that. We will get married at a time when we have nothing. Nothing. And there is this girl who will trust all our fairy tales. She will listen to all our dreams and she will be present. She, she will watch money that could have gone to her hair go to a tender document. But she'll be quiet because she believes the vision. But as soon as Ahab has a tender, he starts drawing from a little house. A girl that has no history with him now causes him to abandon the lake. We have men who are now telling the ocean that sustained them while they were dreaming that the lake is now, the ocean is boring. They have found a pond that is sexy. So you will leave an ocean for a sexy pond stupidity of the highest order. So, so Jezebel says, where do you draw the things that command your emotion? From the farms you don't have or from the kingdom you run? Because we are about to lose all of it, my husband. While you are here crying, you think, you, listen, 
every throne always has someone who thinks they can rule better. So with every hour you are sleeping here crying, there are people who are measuring the throne and measuring their butts to see whether when they sit, they fit. So Jezebel says, you don't get to cry for pawns. You are king of Israel. Are we still together? So, two, draw from the right place. The fact that you are a king should control your emotions more than the farms you don't have. In other words, if you have to choose what controls your emotions, choose the one in which you have power rather than the one in which you are weak. I don't know if you are hearing Jezebel. Jezebel says there are two sources of emotion every day. What you can't do or what you are good at. And Jezebel says, you can draw strength from your failures, which will lead to depression. Or you can focus on what you are brilliant at, which will encourage you and give you the motivation to face any other battle. So you can either let the fact that you don't have a farm control you, or the fact that you are a king should control you. Are we still together, church? All right, so then she says to him, I will give you the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. Jezebel is the most decisive character in the Bible. Jezebel doesn't know middle grounds, and I respect her for that. Read every story where Je Jezebel is. You are either li alive or dying. Yeah. Jezebel is never in the middle. She's never, hey, let's think about this, guys. Ah, uh, should we keep him? Should we kill him? He, no. Jezebel always makes a choice. He must die. He must live. He must die. He must live. Jezebel is decisive. You know, my brothers and sisters, let me tell you. If God blesses you with a mother, a wife, a sister who's decisive, thank him. It's a rare skill. It's a rare skill. It shouldn't be taken for granted. You see, you see, we, we are filled with these theories about undecisive women these days. Eh? Even when you go to a restaurant, she doesn't know what to eat. You have to pick for her to make you feel like a powerful man and a gentleman. You know, I don't know what to choose. Choose for me. <laughs> not Jezebel. Oh, not Jezebel. Jezebel is never unsure. This girl always, always was, was very clear. clear. And, and when, when you, you left, left her, her presence, you, you could talk to her. her. Because, because she, she never speaks the words. words. Jezebel wasn't a politician. Jezebel was a leader. She makes decisions. Now, this is why I respect Jezebel. Although some of her decisions were bad and she suffered for them, nevertheless, when moments came for decisions to be made, she didn't shy away. Let me be very clear. <laughs> Jezebel died the death of a leader than live a life of a coward. When she made decisions, did she suffer for them? Of course, but she made them. Nothing is as difficult as trying to listen to a state of the nation address. And you think to yourself, where is Jezebel when you need decisive leaders? Two hours, you are being told about social coercion inclusive growth. Hey, make decisions. Better we remove you for it than for us to not be clear. A country happy. You need social coercion. You're not going to say that. You're not going to say that. 
Go look at twice. We are building a social compact. You think, my goodness, yeah, the social compact. It's an ambiguous term. It sounds ideologically nice, but it is operationally empty. Jezebel says, a woman is decisive. So, she says, I, I will get you the vineyard. So here comes the next lesson about Jezebel. When Jezebel found Ahab in his moment of weakness, she never attempted to replace him. She compensated for his weaknesses. Never did Jezebel say, you are a weak king, weak husband, I will organize a coup and overthrow you. She says, listen, husband, focus on what you are good at. Where you are weak, leave it to me. Hence she says, return to the throne. That is what you need to do. But I can tell with Naboth, you don't know what to do. Leave Naboth to me. The throne is yours. But Naboth, they are for Jersey. <laughs> you go sit in that throne. Jezebel will get you that vineyard. Are you with me? So Jezebel is very clear. Jezebel is very clear. Because we now live in a world where men and women are toxically fighting. It's, it's even coming to the church. We have lost the art of a biblical Christian marriage. Here in the church, there's a competition between people who are married in the church. Husband and wife are on a mission to disprove and discount each other. There, there are women gunning, I need to earn more, buy a bigger car, buy a bigger house, all in my name. And when I speak, they must know it's mine. Foolish! Jezebel says, your throne is not mine. But when we both succeed, our children's inheritance is protected. So, I don't want your throne, but I can address Naboth. So stay in the throne, I will address. There are foolish men who don't want to trust their wives with the decision making and execution. You are missing out on whatever phenomenal power God has put in your wife. Some of you are married to Jezebels, but you will never know. Because your masculinity is too fragile. But if you understood that the duty of a married couple is to compensate for each other, then you would deploy each other strategically. You are good at this, you go. Not this one. I'll deal with it. And as a result, no one dethrones anyone. We have a common vision. Stay on the throne, I'll deal with Naboth. Why? It's for the good of our children. So we've got two groups now. Divided into four. There are two groups of women. One, women who believe they need to be stupid in order to be loved. So they dial down their intelligence. Jezebel says, never me. Oh, Jezebel was smart, and she never played it down. Jezebel never pretended to be stupid for Ahab to feel comfortable. And I dare say Ahab loved her for it. He loved her for her intelligence. Then there's another group of women. The group that believes if a woman is intelligent, she doesn't need a man. Also, you are foolish. So both these groups are extremes of foolishness. Those who think the richer a woman gets, you don't need a man. Or those who think to get a man, you need to be more stupid. They are both foolish. They are both foolish. 
There's no way you will go in this life and you won't need a man. Stop that nonsense. It's foolishness. It's not practical. You will give birth to sons. What will you teach them after despising their fathers? What masculinity should they inherit from the tongue of a woman who thought men are trash? Can't be double standard. If the father is trash, so is the son. You can't make your son a prince, but your husband trash. Make a choice about what do you think men are. Because you need to pass it to your son. Can't raise a boy, call him a prince, but his father is a dog. From your tongue, he must inherit masculinity. That will make him a better citizen. Make a choice. Then there are two groups of men, also foolish. The other extreme believes never let a woman go to school, never let a woman study. She is going to betray you. Nonsense. Because then life beats you. You get retrenched. You don't get reemployed. Now the family is starving because your beliefs are that women shouldn't work. Lose that foolishness. You can't carry life on your own. You need your wife to be intelligent and present so that life can be smooth. You with me? Then there's the extreme other foolish men. Okay? The extreme other foolish men are the men who believe that the duty of a woman is to just be beautiful. Hey, listen. Children will be born. Then there will be maths homework. Then you will know how far beauty can go. Say me, le, ikraf, ye hyperbolas, we maths. When you are look, you are busy, eh? Trying to do work because, I mean, you are a big thing, eh? You are an advocate, you are a doctor, you are an actuary, you are sitting there doing big work. So you can't help the children with homework. Now what is happening? The brain is boiling under the weave. Because the maths is not balancing. It is foolish to marry for beauty. You have cursed your children to difficulty. But some men look for beauty because they need to control. And the brain intimidates them. But let me tell you something that I respect about Ahab. Ahab married an intelligent woman and it paid off. You will see the value of choosing an intelligent wife the day when a man dies. There are men who died leaving millions. Within three months, the whole family was poor. You married for looks, foolish. You know, when you die, you must be comfortable with who will remain. When you breathe your last, you must tell your children, it is well. Your mother is still here. It is well. Your mother is still here. Because now we are I married beauty, brains, bravery, ambition, decisiveness, which are all the characters of Jezebel. Jezebel is ambitious, decisive. But also more than that, Jezebel doesn't just make decisions. She oversees their operations. In other words, she's not just a talker. She's an implementer. Jezebel doesn't make a decision and then wait for others to follow it through. But look at how she does it and we are wrapping up. She then says, now she's talking to her husband. She says, I'm going to write letters. I'm going to write letters. Don't worry about the content. Put your seal. Because remember, I'm not the king. I'm not the king. I can't invite anyone. I need your seal. But leave the content to me. We are getting you that vineyard. She wrote letters. 
The secretary brought them to Ahab. Ahab, all he did, poor wax, put a stamp. The letters went out. You know, some, some, there are some of us men who now want to be worshipped because I'm very careful with my money. I don't give my wife my card. No, you are confessing to the stupidity of your marital choice. When you marry smart, give her the password to the account. Give her the seal. Leave the content. Watch what she will do. Then you know I married wisdom. When you can just say, my invoices have been paid, Nkoskas. Get into the account. Do what needs to be done. While you march on to do other things. And you know, when I come back, what was three will be six. What was six will be nine. So stop wanting us to celebrate you. Yeah, never give a wife your card. Hey, you married wrong. That's the problem. You are struggling with confessing of the bad choice you made. Because some of us didn't make those bad choices. My wife and I make money together. But part of how I make money requires me to travel. I only send her a WhatsApp. Money is in. I've never, 12 years married, never returned to regret. Never. On the contrary, what she accomplishes is far more than what I could have done. Don't marry stupid and expect us to praise you. Now you want to sound like a man. No, 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 no. So here's my conclusion. I want to celebrate women who have been decisive, ambitious, and operational. Women who have been a credit to their families, especially to their husbands. And I want to say to you, never dial down your intelligence. Never try to be ambiguous and undecisive to look romantic. Be a Jezebel. Your family will thank you one day. Women, be a Jezebel. Be decisive. Be ambitious. Be operational. And as you see with Jezebel, nothing about an intelligent woman says the husband must be disrespected. She was smart, but boy did her husband receive honor from her. It's time we throw down this idea that women who amount to nothing are virtuous. There's no virtue. You failed. Look at Jezebel. There you will see that a woman can be powerful and happily married. She can be executive and still a joy to her husband and a credit to her family. May you be Jezebels wherever you go. May you be Jezebels. Shall we rise to pray? Father, in the name of Jesus Christ this evening, we know the sins of Jezebel. We, no one here is immature enough to think we are saying we should do those things. But she had brilliant characteristics which are needed in our families. And Lord, I wish those characteristics could be imparted to the women in our generation and generations to come. Lord, I want to thank you on behalf of every husband who married the Jezebel, on behalf of every man who knows that even if he went down to the grave, his family will be well. Thank you for blessing us with these Jezebels, these queens who are ambitious, decisive, and operational. Lord, may that spirit be repeated in our daughters. May we raise strong, powerful women who can have it all, a happy marriage and a prosperous life. We debunk the myth that for women to be successful, a man must be disrespected. We debunk the myth 
that for women to be happy, they must lessen their intelligence. We learn from Jezebel that we don't need to be. So, Father, we believe you can do it. For we have asked in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Let all who believe say amen. amen. Um, thank you, Fundisi, as always. Um, <clears throat> we, we are richly blessed by your word. Um, it is it's about four minutes to, and I'm suspecting that we don't have time to sing a song, considering that we're going to get low chitting. Um, so I'm going to wish you all a good night and see you bright and early tomorrow morning. May the Lord please take you home safely and have a good night. Before you go, um, tomorrow we start at 9.30. Song service starts at 9.30, so be here earlier at 9. <laughs>